Welcome to The Art of Adventure. This is episode 160 with Sarah Dandishi. The Art of Adventure is the podcast that helps you travel the world, run your business, and embark on an epic quest. I'm your host, lead explorer, and guide, Derek Laddermilk. Head over to Derek Laddermilk. That's my website, DerekLaddermilk.com, to download the top 10 ways to make money online while traveling the world. I've compiled this list from my experience and all the interviews on this show and some talks I've been giving. So you can go get that for free. It's awesome. Got lots of links and tools for you. Speaking of traveling, we're moving this week with my family to Croatia. So stay tuned for some stories for that. One of the things that we do on this podcast is is bring you travel stories, but also business stories and business how-to. And if you've been thinking of starting a location independent, becoming a digital nomad, or just starting a business that gives you more freedom in your life so you can spend time with your family or sleep in or whatever, it's probably time for you to set up a business strategy call with me. All you need to do is hop on your email and type out Derek at DerekLetterMilk.com and we'll set up a 30-minute business strategy session. That's for free for you guys who are listening. So today's guest, Sarah Dandeshi and I, we've been friends online for a few years. We almost met in person last year when I was in LA. Uh, She's a real life hotel concierge and her life sometimes is like the movie, The Grand Budapest Hotel, where they're concierges calling across the globe to each other, making things happen. And she does make things happen. So she's going to tell us about her secrets for how to get things that normally people don't have access to. She's got a great story about how she found a bicycle in an unknown storage unit. Uh, Stories about buying a puppy, setting up marriage proposals, lots of interesting ones. So that's a very interesting part of her life. She's also got this business, Ask a Concierge. And I see these, these great videos that she produces. They're short and snappy. And so she's going to talk about this business that she runs as well, how she sets up the business partners that she's featuring in the videos, and how she creates the videos themselves um, to to be such high-quality content. So I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Sarah is a ton of fun. So without further ado, Sarah Dandeshi. Welcome back to The Art of Adventure. I'm joined by my friend Sarah Dandeshi. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. This is the first time that we are connecting, having a, having a conversation, but we have been online friends for a couple of years at least. Uh, almost met when I was in LA last year. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know you have a really busy schedule because you are a hotel concierge and you run Ask. A concierge. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'd first just ask you how you split your time between working at the hotel and, and running this business. Well, it I definitely have to say it is a tight rope balance. Um, no, it just takes really being organized. Uh, I, I've been a concierge now 11 years. So as far as understanding the rhythm of that schedule and how to work with that, that comes very easy to me and it's been a long time. So that's something that I can navigate very well. Uh, And then I just really plan out my week and my time around that Um, or certainly plan work around other things that I've got going on with Ask a Concierge. So um, it it takes balance, but it's, I, I think as being a professional concierge, I am naturally organized. So, um, you know, it takes a little bit of, effort, but it can be done and I do it. And when you're at the hotel, is that primarily in the evenings? Uh, currently I, I do work a lot more evenings, um, because that then gives me the, the whole morning and the early afternoon for meetings, um, working on projects for ask a concierge. If I have a shoot, if I have, you know, post to schedule things to write articles to write you, whatever it is. Uh, I like to tend, I tend to get that done in the morning and then head over to the hotel in the afternoon and the evening. Cool. And how does the, your work at the hotel influence what you do with ask a concierge? I mean, really, if it weren't for the fact that I wasn't a concierge, ask a concierge wouldn't have been born. 
um, a little bit of my backstory. So I moved to Los Angeles and I have a, um, a background in entertainment as well too. So as far as in front of the camera, behind the camera, writing, you name it, I've had experience in all of that and I've been a concierge this whole time. So Ask a Concierge was really born, it became the sort of melding of these two worlds that I was living in. And um, so I was able to kind of combine all of my passions and talents in the artistic sort of realm, um, dealing with creating content and then what I do on a daily basis, uh, which is uh, working as a concierge. So uh, they really go hand in hand. And I have to be, I have to say that I'm very lucky in that the hotel in which I work at now is so supportive of what I do. Uh, it brings them a lot of good press as well too. And I'm very careful and mindful that even though my brand is independent, that I understand that whatever I do may trickle trickle to them and have an impact on them. So always very mindful that it's a, a positive impact. I mean, I think, yeah. I think in general, it's nice to have a positive impact on the world. So um, it, that comes easily, but just being mindful about it. And, um, and you know, the hotel is appreciative. So that's been my happy place for right now. <laughs> Great. Which hotel do you work I at? work at the London West Hollywood. And is that, that seems to be a high end. Hotel. It is. It is. It's a. It's a. I would say it would be a four and a half star, but it's a four star hotel. <laughs> and that's uh, out of five. That's out of twenty. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> out of five hotels. Five stars. Okay. Five stars. <laughs> cool. So, so it sounds like, given especially you have your camera experience, mm -hmm. you know, in front of and behind of the camera, that Eska Concierge is a business that almost no one would have even thought to do unless it was you correct specifically doing it correct and it's it was it really was a, a happy accident i was actually taking a writing course and the instructor assigned everybody to come up with a vlog a video blog idea and one girl was into sports one girl was getting married and i'm like i don't know i eat healthy and i work out but i'm not like a guru in that and then i figured well maybe i'll just talk about things that people ask me about all the time, every day I can, I can spout on for hours about Disneyland, Universal, how to see the Hollywood sign, Santa Monica. It seems very mundane to me because it's part of my everyday life, but whatever, I'll give it a go, I'll talk about it. And I put together my first video uh, for the class and everybody was like, whoa, this is awesome. And I was so <laughs> shocked because I'm like, you guys live in LA, you really care? And they're like, no, no, we totally care. Even though we live in LA, it, this is a great reminder for us, like when we have friends in town, even for us when we want to figure out what to do. So that was really, that moment was really um, significant because I realized that even though I may be sharing things about Los Angeles, it's not only of interest to people traveling, it's of interest to people that live here. So that immediately broadened my audience. And I'm like, okay, well, let's like keep doing this and see how people react. And it, it just has snowballed since then. Um, in a great way, in a positive way. And um, it's really cool to see the people that follow within the city, but then also around the world. Yeah. How long have you been doing it? Uh, four years. Four yes. years. Wow. What's been one thing that you really didn't expect to come out of it when you started? Uh, it's, gosh, I, I have to say the without sounding cheesy, but the friendships. I've made so many friends from around the world. And it and and another thing is that it actually has brought new life and appreciation into my job as a concierge. Because I'll cover something as ask a concierge and then maybe get to go experience it or share it with people. And then I'll be at my desk and then I'll have another engagement, an authentic engagement with a guest and it kind of ties it all in. So it makes me appreciate what I do a little bit more and it, and it makes being a concierge doesn't feel like, oh, it's just that day job. It, it ties it together so beautifully and uh, you know I appreciate it for what it's brought for me. So um, I think that's been the biggest surprise, really. Cool, yeah, that's, that's great. I've found the same thing running a podcast. Yeah. People that I interview uh, become become friends we spend this hour together and 
then sometimes, you know, I get to meet up with him. The, the, when I was in LA last year, we connected with three or four art of adventure guests and a, mm -hmm. and a bunch of fans from the show. And, and, you know, almost wherever I go now, there's someone that, that knows Which the show or has been on the show. It, it really so just really, shows you the power really of, cool. um, I really think it's like the power of social media and that you really can make it personal. I think so many times people think, oh, social media, oh, it means that we're, we're becoming less personal and, and there are elements of that. But I also feel that it allows, allows us to broaden our social network, so to speak. And so then you can have these, um, relationships with people that happen to be around the world. So how much travel do you get to do? Do you go to places where some of the people that, that come to your hotel in LA? And oh get yeah, to see them I, I definitely, I'm, my travel is increasing. So I have to say that that's exciting because for me, I love to do that. Uh, I, I always joke around and say that I was practically born on the plane, which I wasn't. Uh, but you know, shortly <laughs> after I was born, I was on a flight uh, to Saudi Arabia as a three week old. And so for me, just travels, just it's, it's in my, my nature. Um, so I am getting to travel more to different conferences, uh, and, and also to, to cover different places. So that's exciting. Uh, and, and then it also enriches my experiences as well with my guests because, you know, they'll come, uh, to the hotel and we can talk about something that we, you know, a place that we've both been to so it, it adds another element of mm -hmm. um connecting as well too yeah before before the interview you mm -hmm. told me that you are mm -hmm. half lebanese and now you're talking about going to to saudi arabia and i, I think you've lived several mm -hmm. places around the world could you talk a little bit about you know how you you know grew yeah up in, uh, definitely in places? so although i have blonde hair and blue eyes and look like i'm a total southern californian girl uh everybody's like you're not from la i'm like no i'm not but I, i've embraced it um i'm actually half lebanese so uh my dad is from lebanon and he met my mother who is basically pennsylvania dutch from allentown pennsylvania and um so hmm. i was born in pennsylvania because apparently my mother wanted to give me a shot at being president, which is, well, you know. Because you have to be born in the country, not just correct. of America. exactly. Parents, right? So there's still a little bit of, ah. you know, time in front of me if I want to do that. But we'll, we'll see. So I was born in Pennsylvania, and then um, my parents at the time were living in Saudi Arabia. And so uh, they were living in Saudi Arabia, and... Uh, that's how I was able to, I mean, that's why we were traveling. It was pretty much going back home. Um, and so travel was just always very um, part of my upbringing. I then lived in London. I lived in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to college in D.C., lived a bit in New York. And then I've been in Los Angeles 11 years. So, um, yeah, again, it's it's kind of part of my upbringing and, and even actually all my cousins on my father's side, they all live in Europe and the Middle East. So that part of the world is, is kind of a, an extension of myself and my family. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. I, I hope to, uh, so, so we just had our mm -hmm. son here in the States and we're heading yes. to Mexico tomorrow for his first trip. I'm sure he'll <laughs> remember it well. Like lots of pictures. <laughs> uh, I don't even know where I was going with that, but oh, my mm -hmm. question, my question is, uh, when you travel, are you meeting and, and using concierges when you <laughs> concierge? You could just what say concierge. concierge. I think it's like, you know, Prius. Yeah, <laughs> or dear, sort of that. Dear. <laughs> exactly. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so are you, are you using the concierge when you, I, when you travel? I am. Well, so it, it depends, uh, because I'm, I am such an easy traveler. I don't, my, I don't, my feathers don't get ruffled easily. Um, it's, you know, on my day to day, I'm, I'm naturally problem solving for other people. So when I travel, I'm just like, let's just go with the flow. Uh, the great thing about the concierge community is that it is just that it's a community and I'm part, part of the organization called Les Clés d'Or, which means the gold keys in French and Les Clés d'Or is this, you could say 
like elite professional organization of concierge and they have these conferences every year. So I attend those conferences and I get to meet all these concierge from around the world. And so when I go to a city, it's not like I'm just using a concierge to, and just like, hey, I'm a concierge too, which sometimes happen, happens, but more often than not, it's like I'm going to a city and it's like, oh, great, I can't wait to see Joe at XYZ Hotel or my friend Alex at this hotel. So they're real, these are real friendships. So tapping into that, um, it ends up making it a, a really special uh way to travel because you immediately tap into these people that have become friends over the years. So, um, so yeah, so I tap into the people I know and then here and there I'll tap into the concierge as well too. Um, especially if it's, you know, looking for that insider knowledge. There's, uh, the movie, the grand Budapest hotel. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) And they have, right. The concierges are calling each other and, and, making things happen. Is that pretty much that accurate? That is totally accurate. It's totally accurate. It's funny because we, we tap into each other all the time. You know, let's just say I've got a guest that needs to send flowers in Moscow. I, I mean, I personally haven't been to Moscow. I don't know anything about florists in Moscow. Um, I can call a hotel and maybe get a referral. And then I can, this actually happened one time as I called, I got a referral, called the florist, Luckily, everybody spoke English, by the way, and but the florist wouldn't take the credit card number over the phone. I mean, then that's fair, fair enough. So then I had to call a concierge contact of mine who I ended up putting down their credit card, and then we were able to send them money. But it's like, yeah, talk about having to use your contacts that you, you really have a connection with. Wow. <laughs> and that's all for some flowers. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that I found myself wondering about was concierge are kind of known for, for just making something happen, Mm -hmm. which I imagine could be like a lot of phone calls and a lot Mm -hmm. of maybe getting a lot of no's from gatekeepers and trying to figure out who's the person to talk to, to make a decision about some VIP experience or something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about how you approach solving a problem when it's sort of a one-off kind of thing? You know, it, it, first of all, um, I'm nice. (laughs) So I try, and I know that sounds like really silly, but it's like, um, I'll call and, and if I don't know where to start, I'm like, okay, well let's just pretty much like a upside down pyramid and just, it's like a wide, it's, you know, you're starting with that, um, wide base and it's like, okay, we'll start with a phishing phone call, so to speak, and speak to somebody and, explain to them, hey, I'm calling from this hotel, I have this guest, this is what we're looking to do. If you're not the right person to help me with this, who can I speak to? And then kind of narrow it down from there. Uh, so it, it just takes, it, I mean, if you explain the situation, it's amazing how many people you can bypass pretty quickly uh, to speak to the person that can help you. And many times, even that first phone call, that person can help you as well. So. Uh, it just takes, you know, being nice about it and, and, you know, being honest and, Hey, this is my situation. How can you help me or who can help me? So, and, and sometimes you get no's. It was funny. I was actually saying to somebody the other day, I was like, I get no's all the time. And I so don't take it personally because it's, it, it, whatever. It's just like, Oh, okay. That door closes, but it's like, let's find the other way around. Um, and I think that's part of being a good concierge is that you don't, get um upset by the nose you just take it in stride and you know you're just constantly thinking okay well if we can't enter that way what's the other way that we can enter Uh, yeah so there's always a way there's always a way i mean you know people have to have some some wiggle room um but you know there there's pretty much always a way i i think that's that's really important you know sometimes i'm trying to arrange things and someone will give me a no and i'll be like it's because you don't like me yeah. or something. You know? Oh, it's so not personal. It's so not yeah, personal. Just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you have a story of, of something that you pulled off that you were, you were proud that you made it happen? Yeah. And it actually, it comes back to this whole, you know, the, the explanation of like, where do you start and how do you find it? So I had a guest approach me a couple years ago. He had flown into LAX 
and he was a cyclist. So he had a really nice bicycle, like a, a road bike. Um, that was in in like a box and then he left it in storage because he didn't need it for the week um, He was gone for 10 days. He came back and he was like Sarah My bike is in storage in a storage unit by LAX the big international airport here and I don't know the name of the storage company And I don't have a claim ticket. All I know is that I talked to a person named Jose <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, well, um, knowing that Los Angeles is as large as it is, there are so many storage units. And then and there are also so many Jose's. How on earth am I going to narrow this down? And I'm thinking like, wow. dude, how did you do that? That's like, that's an expensive bike. What? So I'm like, okay. So I had a moment of thinking like, this is ridiculous. And then I had a moment of being like, <coughs> oh, I'm going to figure this out. So um, I ended up, um, I'm like, okay, well, let's be smart about it. I was like, so how did you even find out about the storage unit? And he's like, okay, well, I flew into American Airlines, and I was referred to them by the baggage people at American Airlines. I'm like, cool, I can start there. Although, Ooh. if you've ever called baggage claim at any airport, it's like trying to call the post office. Nobody answers. So I'm like, okay, let me call, and I really hope that they answer. So miraculously, I kid you not, somebody probably answers in baggage claim maybe five minutes out of the day. It's, it's ridiculous. I call baggage claim and they actually answer. And I explain to them, oh, somebody, you know, was referred to a storage unit. Is there your number one go-to place that you refer people to? They were like, oh yeah, XYZ place. So I go, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm on to it. So I call the XYZ place and, uh, you know, I explained to them, I'm like, are you guys holding a bicycle that you maybe held for 10 days under this name? Do you have a guy named Jose that works there? And they're like, no, we don't have a bicycle and we don't have a Jose. Oh, but this place has a Jose. And I'm like, okay. So then they give me that name and number. I call that other place and, um, Jose actually answers the phone. He's like, oh, yeah, I have this bike for so-and-so right here. So that case in point, it was like really a needle in a haystack sort of situation. But it was just like, okay, how can we be smart about this? And, you know, by just putting two and two together and sharing as much information as I had, it really took me three phone calls, and I found the bike. So... Wow. Yeah. That's, that's that sounds like like really good luck as well, <laughs> but a really smart. It, it, it there was some luck involved, that's for sure. There was some luck, but you know, there's also it it just is being smart about it. Yeah. And there's that Paulo Coelho quote mm -hmm. from The Alchemist where he says once you uh have your purpose or or what's he say when you're following your personal legend the whole universe conspires to help you yes and so it seems like maybe you had a little bit of that definitely definitely well again i th i mean i think that the the luck was in that the baggage claim people answered and that start that started it and then everything else obviously the other places were going to answer the phone but um but you know it, it just takes being kind of open to it and you know you're just trying to help somebody else so it's amazing how many people end up helping you um you know in the, in the spirit of giving <laughs> right yeah so say we're traveling to a place mm -hmm. and we want to you know it's not la there's not a ask a concierge for the city we're going to mm -hmm. it's a different city um and what's the best way is there a way to take advantage of a concierge or someone's knowledge of a city, uh, even if you're not staying in their hotel? Uh, I, there are. There are. You can, if you really want to go the route of a concierge, uh, on, if you are just honest about it and whether you call them or you happen to stop by the desk and say, hey, look, I'm not staying here this time, but, you know, I, I just would love to be able to, you know, ask for your advice on something if you just are honest about that, the, without a doubt, the concierge will help. We want to help people. Um, 
but we're also in, you know, in a fast paced environment and we see a lot of stuff. So when people try to pull a fast one on us and they're, you know, not genuine about it, that's the part where it's like, okay, dude, like we know what's happening. But if you just are open about it, without a doubt, they will absolutely, uh, be helpful. So, um, so yeah, I, you could, you could tap into that or, uh, vice versa. If you're, if you're not at all around any sort of hotels that might have a concierge making friends with locals and, and whether that is the local coffee shop, whether you're staying at a hostel and it's the people that are working there, you know, you just start having those conversations with the people that are around where you're staying. And it's amazing. Everybody's proud of where they live, you know, so they want to share the cool things to do in the city or any sort of advice or tips. Um, so if you're open to, you know, just kind of starting a dialogue, it's amazing how, uh, you can either tap into a concierge or just a local that has a concierge spirit. (laughs) Yeah, perfect. I love that. And and yeah, really playing into people's pride in their, their town is is so effective. It, It totally is. Uh, I've got a couple concierge stories myself now that I'm thinking about oh, it. And I think I, I think I mentioned it to you mm-hmm. uh, when I was in Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon. I can't I think I think it was Saigon, actually. Mm-hmm. I had to sell a house yeah. in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> and the concierge at the hotel helped me like send the documents back and forth and and everything. Uh, and that was actually a hotel next to the one we were staying at. So not the hotel. Um where I was and they were helpful. So, um, yeah, I definitely, um, tipped, tipped him well, which, which I well, thought yes. was it's, probably the right thing to do. It's appropriate <laughs> in that case uh, for sure. The other, the other good experience I had was we were in China and I said, I want to buy some tea. I want to go to an authentic tea market. And the guy sort of drew me this map and like wrote a message. Uh-oh. He was like, okay, just show this message to anyone. And it said, it was written in Chinese characters, but it said like, please help this, you know, poor lost American find some tea or something. Oh my <laughs> you know? uh, and so I just went like to sort of where he said on the map and I would show the card to people and they would look at it and then they would just point <laughs> down the street. Wow. And I'd be like, okay, thank you. <laughs> wow. But you got your and eventually, tea, right? Yeah, we got to. Uh, we we were in this neighborhood and everyone was pointing and then it started, they were sort of like cross pointing and I was like, oh gosh, now we're getting mixed signals. So we knew we were close. So we hopped in a cab and he drove us like 400 feet and he was like, here you are. <laughs> but it was this giant tea market, maybe a mile block long with a thousand different bulk tea shops, you know, wholesale tea. And it was, we spent hours there. You, you If you want to spend $5 on tea, you have to like do a half an hour tea ceremony. Wow. Just to, just to do it. It was really cool. Wow. But incredible. And, and it's great to know that the concierge kind of pointed you in the right direction. <laughs> I thought it was, yeah, it felt so silly with my little, little card with who knows what it said, you know, like, please do not make fun of this white boy or (laughs) (laughs) maybe but it got you there but that's such a clever way to do it and and there have been times that you know how that's that again shows you how the concierge can kind of help you with that language barrier there are many many times that i'll have guests that they don't speak much english at all and so we're barely trying to communicate through like google translate and so Mm. then i'll help them by writing out something for them or typing it and, and translating it that way but yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, like, just goes to show you, even the other story that you mentioned with the concierge, it wasn't even at your hotel, you know, we're here to help. So I, I think it, sometimes there's a little bit of a, 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 a misinformation as far as in regard, in regard to the reputation of the concierge or people are worried to talk to them or like, oh my God, it's going to, they, they're going to cost so much money or they're going to do this. And it's like, you can come to a concierge and be like, hey, what bu- bus route can I take? And that's totally fine and normal. So, um, you know, the fancy way of saying it is that they're that liaison to the city. Um, but another way of just thinking about it is like, hey, look, they're there to be your local friends and will help you. And and honestly, we get asked everything. So by no means are we ever going to judge, you know, because we you name it, we've heard it all. And if you're asking like, how to take 
the bus from XYZ to XYZ, that is not embarrassing at all. <laughs> so, Have you ever been asked to participate in a crime? A participate in a crime. Would you like to participate in a crime? Um, no. No, I mean, the... Well, it, that's kind of like a blurry area. I mean, no, well, no, no. But, I mean, I, okay. Let me just start by saying, no, I have not done anything. Obviously, there are different rules and laws in different parts of the world. So there are times that people come and maybe they don't know about certain things and they're like, oh, I'd like to get a, a escort for the evening. And it's like, oh, I can't help you with that. Or, but in general, and I think it might have to be do with the fact that being a, a female, I don't get asked for things that are too um, mm. out, out of the range of possibilities. I think that that happens more so to my, um, my male colleagues. People are more apt to go up to them, whereas people aren't as likely to come up to me. Interesting. Yeah, right? Even though I'd be like, hey, I could totally tell you where like the strip club is down the road. We can talk about it. It's like not <laughs> it's not uncomfortable for me to talk about it. But I can understand how maybe a group of guys might not want to come up to me and be like, hey, where can we go? And th- and that is legal. And that's a legal thing. But that's you know not something that everybody feels comfortable with. <laughs> right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, just just one more question. Um, I, so you probably get you know some things asked more common than than others. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the more unusual things that people have asked you that's stuck out for you? Uh, I had a regular guest who was based in Vegas, and he kind of, he hosted a lot of parties, and so every time he would come to LA. He, like, he wouldn't even pack a bag and he would just be like, hey, Sarah, can you go get me? I need five, five shirts, um, like four pants, I, four Nike Air Jordans. I, want, I need them in this color. Da, 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 da. And we would literally send somebody out to go buy his clothes for him. And then he'd just leave it there. Um, the number of times that we purchased... Louis Vuitton evidence sunglasses when those were the rage and those are $900 sunglasses. I mean, we probably purchased them for him at, at least a dozen times. Um, so you get, you'll get unusual requests like that. Um, and then you'll get some where people are like, Hey, I want to plan an engagement and can you help me? And absolutely, you know, so that's, that also help happens as well too. Whereas, you know, maybe the day-to-day stuff is helping with reservations or tourist attractions or things like that. So it really it really runs the gamut. And, I mean, we've helped people, you know, with their documents for business um, to, I mean, you name it, it's probably, probably been asked. <laughs> oh, another fun one that I just remembered. Um, we sometimes have guests that come in the summertime. And, you know, they're here for a longer period of time because they're on summer vacation and they want to buy a puppy. And so we help them find breeders and then they find a breeder and then they buy a puppy and then they've got the puppy. And then next thing you know, they have to go home. And so many times if they don't live in the U.S., they have to have um, appropriate documentation, vaccines, all of that. Um, for the little puppy that they get. So that's a little bit of an unusual one, but we've encountered that quite a bit. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I never would have, never would have thought. I know. <laughs> what's, what's the uh, appropriate tipping policy with a concierge if they're doing something like buying you expensive sunglasses or <laughs> exporting a puppy? Exporting a puppy. I mean, you know, it, it really... It all depends on how involved the process ends up being. You know, it, it ultimately is at the discretion of the person tipping, but it's it's a sign of gratitude. And if it's something that, like, let's say it's like a quick, easy thing, you know, uh, five, ten dollars or something like that is totally normal. If it's something more involved, you know, something more than that would make sense. So. Um, I, I think it really just is kind of uh, reflective on the amount of service and attention the concierge has has given. So 
I always like kind of get wary about saying a, an amount because I don't want people to be like, oh my god, I don't want to talk to a concierge because I don't want to tip them like this gigantic amount. But if you know, if you're only using them for something, you know, smaller, maybe not less, not as involved, it's just a you know a, a sign of appreciation. So excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So so I uh, I'm in the habit of giving two dollar bills uh tips to well my baristas and bartenders and whatnot yeah not necessarily concierges but because almost almost nobody has two dollar bills so it's like a special those are fun <laughs> those are fun i get those of, too and they, it's always like a cute okay. thing so i love it yeah. <laughs> uh so i'd like to transition a little bit to talk about your videos mm -hmm. and the ask a concierge business yeah what is the business model for that how where does most of the income come from uh most of it comes from um advertising and and sponsorships so to to kind of give a backstory you know ask the concierge is um it's an influencer brand it's a content creating brand um it's not a concierge service um which the name might be a little tricky for some um or at least you know be a little bit um, have people thinking otherwise, but, um, right. so, you know, it's really about, cause my whole thing is it's kind of taking that concierge desk and bringing it to everybody so that everybody can, um, benefit from the information. And, um, and so, and video for me is, is such an engaging platform. And I love that whole creative process of, of doing something that's, um, fun, creative, and then also has substance to it. So, um, so yeah, so as as far as the business model, it is it's definitely um, ad space on on the website, and then um, like some some content is actually sponsored as well too. So uh, which we we sift through, and we don't just stick, you know choose everything, but where um, where it's appropriate, you know we we hop onto that. Yeah. So. Um, you know, recently I saw you went skiing uh -huh. and I saw you were doing like something at maybe Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. um, do they approach you and they say, maybe we want to feature this experience or, or this thing? Like, would that be a match or, or are you pitching them? How do you set that yeah, up? It depends. Um, it, it all depends. Sometimes if I hear about something and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Um, I, I'll approach them. And then other times it's, um, many times they actually approach me. So, uh, you know, the, um, mountain high, which is where I went, uh, skiing, they actually reached out and they, they approached me. And so I was like, yeah, I'm down to go skiing and, <laughs> and let's see what this looks like. And, and by the way, my favorite thing is to get as physical as possible. So, um, I, the, the more outrageous, so, and not that skiing is outrageous, but the fact that it's cold and I'm kind of used to being in Southern California, it was a little, it was a, that was a bit of an adventure for me. Um, but Universal Studios, I do have an established relationship with them. I did a couple videos for them last year. So the first one I ended up, um, I approached them and they liked it so much that um, they reached out again and they had me do Halloween Horror Nights when they were doing that. And then they also reached out and they were like, hey, we would love for you to cover our VIP experience. Um, and so I was able to do, to do that video. So um, sometimes it might just take the initial reach out, but then once they, they see uh, the product in the final, in the final video, they really get on board with it. And so they're like, oh, can we do this? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I love it. So um, so yeah, it's a little bit of give and take, but it's, it's just kind of like sifting out the, the cool things. And, and really my barometer is like, if I find it interesting, um, I feel like m most of the time other people will find it interesting as well too, just because, um, I, I see a lot. <laughs> so it's like, if it piques my interest, it's got to yeah. pique somebody else's interest. Do you have any advice for, you know, because now we have lots of influencers, mm -hmm. people with Instagram accounts, YouTube podcasters mm -hmm. um that talk about specific niches and i've had success a little bit where I, i'll approach a, a hotel in the off season and say i'd like to to feature you in exchange for mm -hmm. staying there um how do you how do you approach when you are pitching someone 
you know, and you want to like do the VIP mm-hmm. experience and, and in return, you'll either get paid or, um, are you, are you mostly just getting these experiences for free or are you actually getting paid? Uh, or? It, it's, it's a mix. So it depends on what it is. Sometimes I'll opt to do it for free if it's with a bigger brand for the visibility. Um, but if it's a smaller brand, you know, I, I do try, there is a fee because, um, it's not like it's just me, but I do have a team. So, um, it, you know, and it's, it's not, as I sometimes like to say, it's not an after school project, but it is actually using people's professional, um, talents. So, and, and, you know, we're very reasonable and we work with people's budgets in regards to that. So, um, it is a, a bit of a, a give and take. And so we seek it way out where it's, where it's appropriate, you know, um, but we're always willing to work with people uh, on their budget to, to make it happen, especially if it's something that we're like, Oh my God, this is so interesting. We've got to do it. So, um, but you know, I have a media kit and, um, that I send out. Um, I also highlight the fact that, you know, I do work within the hospitality industry. So, um, I understand, you know, the professionalism of it. I think sometimes, especially in today's day and age, um, with social media, quote unquote, influencers and all of that, you have a lot of people and maybe they've been lucky or this or that, and they have a lot of, they've got a a huge following, but unfortunately due to whatever their experience is, they aren't maybe quite as professional about some things. Um, and that might be just due to lack of experience. So what I really try to bring is like, Hey, look, this is who I am. These are my numbers. This is what we look to do. This is our turnaround time. We are a well-oiled machine. And just kind of sharing that, it lets people know that, oh, wow, okay, I'm dealing with a professional here, and I know that um, they're not going to ask us for something and then not deliver. You know, I never I never do that. Uh, last year, I, we ended up producing 108 videos. So, you know, just sh- wow. sharing that number in and of itself, people are like, okay, cool, real deal. It's not like this is a, you know, a hobby on the side it's like this is you know an actual production company and this is happening so um i think it's just really about presenting yourself in the most professional way possible and then certainly um a very um uh relatable way so um that they feel comfortable talking to you as well and you're mostly in discussions with marketing I, uh, yeah, I'm, I just am. It, and it, it, honestly, it all depends on, on the organization. I do talk to PR firms and marketing people, but, um, sometimes if it's a smaller company, um, or certainly I also have a lot of my own contacts, I'll go through and I'll actually talk to the owners of the companies if they're smaller ones. So, um, hmm, because right. it's like, why get a third party involved? It's like, okay, cool. We can just talk about it. And, and it really is tapping into a lot of my, my resources just these are these are contacts that I've made over the course of 11 years of being a concierge. So I'm established in that regard in Los Angeles, which gives me a, cer- a certain amount of credibility because they've actually worked with me in a different capacity. Um, but then I just take that, um, you know, that professionalism and use that when I'm dealing with other places, uh, whether it's like other destinations, um, just so that they know what they're dealing with. Yeah. And are the videos the most enticing part of the deal for them or is it your large amount of Twitter it's followers? It's the videos. Or? I, it really, it's um, because, you know, you know, video in, and I keep all of my videos to a minute or less um, because that way they can be shared pretty much on all the main platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and so because of that, and I always share it with them. So all of a sudden they're getting something that they can keep long after I'm gone. Um, and I, you know, because I work with so many different brands, I'm very mindful of the language and the style. And so keeping it on brand for them, but then also infusing it with me and my brand as well too. So, um, I, I, that's a, that's a big selling point one could say is that they actually get to have a video then as well too. And in a minute video, how much <laughs> footage are you taking and what does your team So look like? I am 
I have worked with larger teams before, but for for this and for the the point of this, just to keep down costs all around, um, I have a fantastic camera camera operator who is also my editor, and we've done all of these videos together. So we basically have a history of producing now easily over 115 videos. So we have a sort of rhythm around it. We know what the final product is going to look like. What we as far as what we want out of it, um, we plan out our shots. We, you know, we have a conversation. It's like, okay, well, we want to highlight this, so we want to make sure that we get coverage on X, Y, Z, um, and then we we work uh, very closely uh, to putting that together. So, be it the day of the shoot, um, you know, we're grabbing as much footage as possible. We always get more than we need, um, but you know, it's like at that point, you know, you're there and you might as well take advantage of it. So I would say that we probably take a solid 30 minutes of footage to bring it down to a minute. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Cool. I'm, I'm interested personally in highlighting some of my adventures. Like we're going to be going uh-huh. out into the desert down in Mexico. When we go to Europe this summer, we'll be exploring, old castles and hard to reach national parks and things like that. What, what would be the best way for me to sort of highlight and compile even, is it possible to do? If oh, I'm yeah, on my it's own? totally possible to do on your own. Uh, you know, it's funny because even though I have, um, a, a team that helps me, I also many times I might have, I might travel and it just might be me. So, and in that case, then I'm the one compiling footage, you know, in that, in that case, I say have at least two cameras that you're comfortable with. Um, I always say two because you want to have a backup. Um, So two cameras that you're comfortable with and then figure out what software works best for you to put together um, a video and how you want to, um, you know, compile it. If you are, are so inclined, you can even go as far as to be like, okay, how do I want this to look in the end? Like, what's my story? And then when you understand what your story or the arc of your um, the experience that you want to capture, then it'll make it far easier when you're going out there and you're getting footage of what you, of your experience. Um, you can also just fly by the seat of your pants and be like, I'm just going to get as much footage as possible and then put it together that way. That totally works too for some people. Um, so it just depends. You can, you can be a little bit more focused with it. Um, which I think makes it easier in the long run. Um, but I always say just get as much footage as possible and and have those moments. Um, I, and, and then like, you know, put it together and maybe, you know, find a song that inspires you that will, you know, maybe help the story along or, um, or, or, you know, a humorous element that you end up having like a repeating thing. Um, something like that, that just kind of gives it a little bit of a, a callback or a, a purpose. And I think it makes it far easier when you end up putting together a video afterwards. Cool. Yeah. It's like coming up with, you know, uh, thinking how you want the story to go, like coming up with your thesis a little, when you're writing. A exactly. But you know, if it's really just, if it's, if it's not coming to you, fine, just relax on it. And, um, you know, just, go out there and, and you'll discover it along the way. Sarah, is there anything I haven't asked you about in either side of your business that you want to make sure people know? Just trying to see. Um, no, I, th- I think that's, that's, I think you, you definitely covered some great things and great topics. And, um, I think you covered, you covered all the main points. <laughs> okay, good. I have two questions that I ask all of my guests. The first one is, if you could change or add anything to the world, what would you want the world to have? Mm, um, Okay, it'll sound cheesy, but I'm just going to say it. (laughs) Um, More positivity. And um, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning. But there's so much going on in this world right now, uh, within the U S outside of the U S. Um, and we're so much more connected than we've ever been. And I think that oftentimes leads to, you know, it allows people to be 
negative about things or whether it's a Debbie Downer or whether they're actually just downright mean. Um, so think about yourself and your day-to-day -day actions and what you contribute to the world and, and try to make it a little bit more positive. And I, I think that if we all inch towards that a little bit more, it'll just, it'll have a resounding impact. Yeah, and, and you're right. It, it does have a huge impact. I think the studies about happiness show that your happiness affects people that are like two or more connections removed from you. So like your partner's friends mm -hmm. or your kids' friends, parents or, you know. Yeah. yeah I mean, so. I think it's it's also a little bit of an energy thing. So it's like if you have that and you, you take that moment to be like, I'm going to be positive, that's an outward literally outward positive energy that you're putting out there and how many times have you thought about maybe friends or or individuals that they are just they are down on the dumps and they are really whether they're not going they're going through a hard time or whatever the case and they're almost like that black hole of energy and you just feel like woo I can't get near that because that is a a suck of energy so it's like okay we're we're all on this together um have your moment to have you, you know if you have a, a, there's a bad time, absolutely, you know, we all go through that, but, you know, acknowledge it and then be like, okay, but I have control over the energy that I'm contributing to the world. And it can just be a smile, you know, it can be as simple as a smile, but, um, but taking ownership of that, um, I think will really, it, it goes a long way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Final question. What is your definition of adventure? Ooh, it's, um, going outside your comfort zone is what it is and I love doing it and that's one of my things I actually started at the beginning of this year not really intentionally but I uh, keep track of of new things that I do all the time and and it can be as something as simple like oh my goodness I did a hike today and I did a different path than I've ever done it could be something as simple as that or I you know took a different way to work and I keep track of that and it just go. It's like that happy reminder of like there's adventure everywhere, and and if you if you keep track of those moments, I think you just have a better outlook on life because you're like, cool, look at all these first time things that I'm getting to experience um, in the day to day, and so I think so many times that people uh, give the idea of adventure. It's such a grandiose thing. Oh, I have to go on this like trek in the Sahara and it's like well you could that would definitely be an adventure but it's like <laughs> but like if you focus on the day to day how many adventures there are all around us and it makes you engage like you then are like wow my life is actually kind of cool I tried a different latte today okay cool <laughs> <laughs> you know so I, I don't know that's that's what I see adventure is it's just going outside your comfort zone because then you grow from that um, and so I love it. I'm definitely a big proponent of, you know, find adventure in the day to day. Um, and you will just grow tenfold. <laughs> I love that. You reminded me of a Calvin and Hobbes oh. book title. Yeah. The, the titles instead of there's adventure everywhere, it's there's treasure everywhere. Ooh. And it's him just like digging up rocks in the dirt. Yeah. You know, um, so it's very, very appropriate. It's so appropriate. Sarah, where can people find you online should you wish to be found? I wish to be found. Please find me. Um, <laughs> pretty simple. It is just ask a concierge on all of my social media handles. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are my, my main base. And it's ask a concierge. Um, and then also my website, askaconcierge.tv. So uh, you can find me and please reach out. I love uh, talking to people, meeting people for the first time. Um, and I, I try to be very engaged with everybody. So reach out. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. It was really fun. Thank you for having me. This was great. Yeah, all right. Bye-bye. Right, bye. All right. Another great episode with Sarah Dandeshi. Of course. She's awesome. You guys know that by now. And I really love her business because it's a great example of taking 
existing skills that she had. She was already a good concierge. She already knew about writing and producing videos. And she went and created Ask a Concierge, which is the perfect mashup of her talents, something that is even more rare and valuable. So that's a really good way to approach business, combining your skills and talents to make you and your business a a unique entity. There's almost going to be no one else in the world with your specific combination of skills and talents. And of course, I love to help people get businesses set up that let them travel the world so that I can hang out with cool people. And so that, that you guys can spend time with your family or go see cool sites that you've always wanted to see or spend time hanging out with interesting people. So if you want to get started on your own location independent business, drop me a line. Just email me, Derek at DerekLoudermilk.com. I'll send you a link to my calendar where you can book a session and we'll set it up and we'll go from there. That's all for today's episode. Now it's your turn to go out there and be adventurous. Adventurous.